Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble and I am here with Maria Herrera from Evergreen Entertainment. And we're going to be talking about how to figure out how much your release is going to cost, how to figure out how you're going to pay for it, you know, Mm -hmm. all that stuff that we all worry about as artists. But before we get into that, I would love to have you, Maria, share kind of your story, your background. I know that you've worked with different kinds of artists over the years. So let them know kind of what your journey has been in the music industry so far. Sure. So I actually started out as a major fangirl. Um, I love Justin Bieber as a teenager, and that was kind of my in and my start. And I really had no idea what it took to be in the music industry at that time, but I just knew I had to work in the industry. And I eventually beat my way in with his team, and I worked a lot on the fan engagement side of things. So um, digital marketing for merch campaigns, tours, things like that. I did that for about eight to 10-ish years. Um, And then I moved to Nashville from Florida and I worked for a few different music PR firms here in town. And that's where I really started to um, work with a lot of independent artists and started to see how mismanaged so many independent artists budgets are, um, because that's just the way the industry is built these days. And um, eventually from there, I created Evergreen Entertainment to kind of fulfill my own vision of what I thought the industry should be. Um, you know, combating the toxicity of racism, sexism, you name it, and providing artists with transparency, authentically passionate support, not just on the finance side, but also through PR, digital marketing, and all the things. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Brie, for having me. I think it's so important that a podcast like this exists because there's just really not enough real accurate information for independent artists, especially right now and resources for them to kind of know how to navigate the business side of things, which is so important if you're going to have a long-term career. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I'm curious, like, you know, when you say there's not enough resources, I feel like there's so many more resources now than when I started my first podcast in 2015, right? Back then (laughs) it was like the total wild west for indie artists because there was, you know, basically no more labels for them to Mm -hmm. to go to and and stuff like that, they really had to start managing on their own. Where do you feel like indie artists these days are lacking in knowledge, even though, you know, we've got the internet where there's so many places they can get information? Sure. Yeah. I think it is really awesome how social media and even on like TikTok, I've seen so many um, creators whose profiles are dedicated to educating artists and certain ones I really look up to and respect. But then unfortunately, I think at the same time, there's been this um, increase in scammers, honestly, Mm -hmm. and people who simply want to sell a workshop that may or may not really give artists genuine tools because of they want to make the money. And so I think it's about navigating the digital age and the modern resources that we're having these days, but also being aware that just with all the bad, with all the good things that come in with that, there are so many bad things to look out for. And a lot of the times, especially independent artists who are so hungry and they're just trying to pursue their dream it's very easy to fall into traps because so many times in this industry, people can present themselves as very authentic and that they have your best intentions in mind. But then, you know, two or three months in, you kind of realize that that's not their actual truth. Um, And so I think it's just about kind of, you know, it's, it's, there's never going to be a clear cut answer of you have to look out for this kind of business or this kind of person because they're going to do you wrong. It's about knowing your own intuition and, having more and more experiences, because I think being able to vet people quickly is only going to come with with more experience. 
Yeah. And I think also sometimes it's not necessarily that the person that you work with is a scammer. It's just that they're offering you a service that you don't need right now. I yes. see this a lot with like very early artists. They invest a lot of money in PR or radio or whatever. And then like putting out their very first single and they have like nothing to back it up. Right. And so I feel like, you know, if those service people were doing their due diligence, they should say like, Hey, why don't you contact me in a year, <laughs> you know, yes. when you're ready for this and when you should be spending this kind of money. But of course, everybody needs to work. And it's not that they're not doing their job. Like they're going to do their best for that artist, but there's only so much you can do when you're first starting an artist is first starting out. Yeah. And I know as a business owner myself, especially in the beginning, when we were kind of getting our reputation and our footing, especially in Nashville, I did have those moments where people would come to me and I felt like, oh, you know, you're not as established as I would like you to be in order to do my best work for you. And so I think on the flip side, just as artists kind of have to be serious with themselves um, about these types of situations, I think business owners, like you said, have the responsibility to be honest in those situations. And maybe it means turning down money. But I think in the long, long run, and I've certainly experienced this, where saying no to those things and maybe saying not now you know, and being transparent and using that as a teaching opportunity for these artists, it's really only going to benefit you on the business side in the long run, because then you can have a better reputation and you can just feel better about the work that you're doing at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. So for you, when you have artists coming to you, like, where do you want to see an artist at before they're really ready to work with you and utilize all the services that you have to provide? So, I mean, we're really flexible. We certainly work with some artists who are a bit underdeveloped. They maybe have like a few singles out, but then nothing else besides that. But in those situations, I would only agree to work with somebody if their upcoming music that we would be working on, I am very passionate about it as a music fan, um, because then I know that the pitching that we're going to do or the networking that we're going to do on their behalf, I can be really authentic about it and I can really enjoy it at the same time. And I think that the results will naturally come in those situations. But for the most part, I think we try to work with somebody who already kind of understands how the industry works, already has had, you know, quite a few years releasing music, playing shows, and we're not having to necessarily teach them about how to do distribution or things like that. And we kind of are, you know, maybe three steps ahead already where we can just kind of take this polished project that's really high quality. And we know that any interviews that they do, they're going to be very professional in and things like that. And that way, everybody can just be operating at a little bit of a higher caliber, um, and the results will be obviously a million times better in that case. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. Um, so how do you feel about maybe the branding side? Like, let's say that their music is awesome, but they haven't really figured out who they are as an artist, what their story is, how to brand themselves online. Would you take someone like that who's got the goods, like the great music, but they haven't developed kind of their, their marketing side yet? Yeah, actually, that's some of my favorite projects to work on. We actually have this thing called a branding and identity workshop, where we work for two to three months with a client to basically put them through a boot camp of questioning every little thing about themselves that they probably haven't even asked themselves yet. And honestly, most of our Zooms with those types of clients are more like therapy-ish kind of sessions <laughs> where we're getting down to the nitty gritty. We're having them reflect on not just what kind of genre do you want to make music for? It's about, you know, what are your biggest passions outside of music? And because all of those things are eventually going to tie into your music career in some way or another, because working in this industry, so much of your personal life bleeds in to your art. Um, yeah. And I think getting to work with an artist who kind of has this clean slate in terms of branding, and we kind of get to go on that adventure with them and help them decide what's your color palette going to be and, you know, what kind kind of person, not just the demographic that you're wanting to attract, what kind of person, what are their habits, um, who, what other artists are they fans of, what kind of shows do they like to go to the most, having those clear things already in place 
before we even try to do a PR campaign or, you know, market their next single. When they have confidence in all of that groundwork, they're able to make content so much more naturally. And all of the little struggles that we see artists, you know, on any level, even major label sign artists are struggling with social media right now. Um, whenever you have that clear identity to fall back on, everything is so, 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 so much easier. So yeah, I love getting to brand artists. And I would say that that's pretty much the kind of client that we tend to work with most if they were to be um, more on the underdeveloped side of things. Um, it would be more of like, okay, we're working with a clean slate. Your music is really awesome. We're very excited about you. We think you have a really good head on your shoulders. Now let's see if this is something that's actually, you know, able to be made into something really awesome. That's great. Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm definitely on the same page with you with that and the way you, the way that you do the branding and you're right. It does make it so much easier for them to create content. Yes. Otherwise it's yeah. kind of like pulling teeth sometimes. Oh girl, you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, so what, so what would you say to those really, really early artists, the ones that are starting out and maybe they're trying to bootstrap their career. I know that you know, they tend to feel like, well, you've got to have money to make money, but I don't have money and I don't have fans yet. And if I do a crowdfunding, like who's going to mm -hmm. support me because I don't have fans. You know what I mean? It's like, it's hard to get that snowball move going down the hill. You feel like you're always pushing it uphill. Yes. Oh my goodness. It's really difficult to give advice to an artist in that situation if they're not willing and ready and able to accept it and fully digest it. Mm -hmm. I see so many times people will give advice to a young artist or maybe somebody who hasn't never even released music, but they're hoping to. And you can kind of see like the advice just goes in one ear and out the mm -hmm. other because they're really just focused on the music. They just want to write another song and just release it without any plans or any thoughts. And it's really hard to get somebody to believe it and really digest it until they're ready. Um, but if they are ready to actually hear it and take the advice, I would say, actually, before we talk about crowdfunding or investing or anything else, I think the most important thing, you need to focus on your personal finances first mm -hmm. and have a personal emergency fund before anything else. And that's something that I, I was talking with a friend earlier today about that, how we really in this industry don't talk about personal finances enough because like I said so much of your personal life will inevitably bleed into your artist's career and so having an emergency fund so that way whenever you're working on your big EP release if your car has a flat tire you're not going to have to pull from your marketing um, you know area in order to mm -hmm. make ends meet you have a backing and you can feel really comfortable in your life. And then you're able to focus on the creativity more. Um, so yeah, that's where I would start 100%. And then in terms of crowdfunding, especially if you don't really have fans or followers or, you know, a network of personal friends who are super rich to be able to invest in you in that way, I think unfortunately you need to be, and I know this is so frustrating for a lot of artists to hear, but you need to be thinking one, two, three years um, into the future, and you need to be saving as much as possible. It is so expensive to be an artist, not just because producing a song is expensive, but because, you know, taking days off of work to go and play shows or whatever else it may be is takes out of your personal life so, so, so much. And so if you can start building a sinking fund that you know, okay, three years from now, my biggest dream is to start releasing music. So let me start every single month. Let me put away a hundred dollars or whatever I can um, into a separate account. And I know that that's going to be there for me ready whenever I'm ready to release music. And when the creativity has kind of come to fruition um, and you feel really confident about a certain group of songs or something that you have, because I think a lot of artists wait until until like when the music is done, then they're like, okay, now let me start a crowdfunding or now let me start looking for people to help me. And I want to release this in three months. That's just not, I mean, it, you can make, you can do that, but I can't say that necessarily it's going to be as successful or you might not be as comfortable and confident with it. If you had entered into it with, you know, two or three years of savings. Yeah, no, that's so true. And, and you're right. People don't, generally talk about that because I think 
you know, we don't, we don't like to have to say to artists, like, look, your first few albums, you're probably going to have to sink most of the money in yourself. (laughs) Right. But it's true. Yeah. Honest, right. Yes, it is really true. I mean, I just had an artist come to me the other day and and they don't really have any monthly listeners. Their music is really awesome. But honestly, it sucks to have to say it, but there's a lot of really talented artists out there. And you can't just approach a random person on the street or on social media posts and say, hey guys, can everybody donate to my crowdfunding and really expect people to want to jump at the opportunity um, because they have to have some sense or another of a return of value um, in that investment. And I know that there's some like Patreons and things where people can, you know, do different videos and stuff for their donators. And I think that if you have a network of people who are able to do that for you, I've seen a lot of artists have really successful campaigns on that. But I think if you are a baby artist having, you know, little to no releases, I, the number one thing to do is just to save your money as much as possible. Yeah. I think that's really good. And I also, I do recommend that artists do a small crowdfunding campaign. A lot of times when they're doing a release, like, like an EP or or album Mm -hmm. release, just because there are people in your world, like, even if you don't have a lot of fans, you might have those people that just really want to support you really want to believe in you, you know, friends, uh, you know, your favorite uncle, whatever, they want a chance to like, be able to give to what you're doing. And it doesn't have to be high pressure, just like, Hey, just do a 30 day thing, go out to people. Because honestly, like when you do a crowdfunder, the people that support you the most are people that are already your friends, people that know you in person. You know, it's not random strangers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult to get random strangers on the internet to donate to your your cause. And even if you have a group of like five friends and they can each give you a hundred dollars, five hundred dollars <throat> with um a release, whether that's like paying for your production or your cover art or something, can go a long way yeah. if it's utilized the right way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about like release budgets. Cause I think, you know, I mean, you can obviously go from like bare bones to like going absolutely crazy, you know, with, you know, my, my mom keeps telling me there's this artist, she watches like Fox nation or something. There's this artist (laughs) that keeps, uh, I think her name is Kinsey. She keeps there's commercials. Like every single commercial is for her new single. And my mom was like, is this, how much is this person investing in commercials? Right. So you can go from, you know, I just am putting nothing into this. I'm just putting it out there and hoping for the best, or I'm going crazy and promoting myself on television. So, you know, how do you know what kind of budget, like, do you think it depends on where you are in your career, how much money you budget for a, re- let's just say, let's just say an EP release. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think in the beginning, there really is no sense in throwing thousands of dollars into ads or anything like that, because if the foundation isn't there and you don't already have a lot of releases for new people to fall back on and to digest and things like that, then the ads are only going to go so far. But then obviously, if you somehow caught fire and you're gaining hundreds of followers every single week or something, then yes, that you should definitely start investing more if you can. Um, I think a lot of artists, especially people probably listening to this podcast who are still trying to navigate, okay, what's my plan going to be? It's really, it can be really common to look at other major artists, like the artists that you look up to the most. Like for me, if I looked at Ariana Grande and her music videos, and I thought, that's what I want to do with my career. Yeah, you can do that maybe like in the future, (laughs) but not anytime soon. And I think um, a lot of people who aren't involved in the industry as much as we are don't realize how much money is behind those major artists and so it's really easy to compare yourself to them and whenever your video isn't as cool as that artist then you it's easy to really feel bad about yourself and to therefore want to splurge more on your next video Mm -hmm. but it's really about having patience and understanding that yes this video might not cost ten thousand dollars it might be a thousand dollar video that i worked with my friends to make eventually I will get there. And it's important for me to not go into debt or anything right now. So that way I can get there comfortably. 
Yeah. And also they're spending that much money, first of all, because a label is fronting it. Second yes. of all, because they know that they have the distribution channels for millions of people to see it. So it's worth that, yes. right? We as independent artists do not have those distribution channels without spending a lot of money. Oh my goodness. Yes. And also not just on like the video side of things, but even something like music production, getting your song produced a lot. I've seen a lot of artists who have basically released no music yet, but they have really high standards for themselves. And so they say, I'm only going to work, especially here in Nashville, because there's a lot of music producers here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm only going to work with the best of the best, the guy who has produced all of my other favorite big country stars, because those people you Usually, if you can get in contact with them and they have time, they would be willing to work with you, but for what price? Right. And is mm -hmm. that really worth it? I always say it, it definitely is to a certain extent worth it to invest in the quality of your music on the production side, because as so long as you don't delete those songs off of Spotify, um, your future fans will be able to listen to them and you never know which song is going to really stick with somebody and make them become a long lasting fan. So it's important to make sure that your music is consistently high quality, but you don't need all the bells and whistles right off the bat. And that no, goes for working true. with PR agencies or marketing agencies. It's very easy to feel like, and oh, if I just sign with this company and pay them $2,000 a month, they're going to make me a star mm. when that's, you know, you know, that's yes. just not going to happen. <laughs> no, no. And, and, and the thing is, there are a lot of really talented producers that cost middle of the road prices, Yeah, you know, that you can afford. I mean, you're not like getting your, your brother to record you in the garage or something, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. but there's so many producers that work for a very affordable, decent yes. wage. Maybe they haven't won Grammys yet, but just ask for some samples, listen to some stuff that they've done from artists that are similar to you. Mm -hmm. And also something else to pay attention to in those situations is your personal connection with that producer. Mm -hmm. Do you guys work well together? I would much rather work with a producer who oh, inspires yeah. me and helps me find my sound more and more every time I work with him than just somebody who's going to try to make me sound like every other big artist that they've worked with. Exactly. Yeah. I had a friend who, who had a producer that just really wanted her to sound in a way like it was, it was early 2000, I think. And he wanted to make her like very, very alternative sounding. And she's like, mm. that's just not how I hear my music, you know? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Like it, it sounded really cool, but it just didn't really fit who she wanted to be as an artist in the long run. Yeah. And it's, it's really tough whenever an artist is less experienced and they're just starting out and maybe they still haven't even found their exact sound. So maybe they're, they are really susceptible to following other people's pressures or advice. Um, and, and eventually, unfortunately, I've seen some artists who even like years into the future, they, they have this epiphany where they realize that, oh, wait, I haven't actually been doing what I want to do. Oh I've just been doing what I thought everybody else wanted me to do. Yep. It mm -hmm. does happen. <laughs> so let's just say, um, an artist comes to you and they've maybe, maybe they've had two albums or two EPs that they've put out on their own. And now they're really wanting to like have this next one be kind of their breakout thing. Would, do you have like a kind of a range of numbers of like, this is what you really need to spend to make this kind of your breakout EP or album? Well, you know, with social media these days and TikTok, I think that there's a lot that artists can gain through releases for free. Mm -hmm. As long as you have the time and energy to dedicate to it and you're serious enough about it, um, I think that there is a lot that you can just kind of bootstrap and save a whole lot of money on. But in terms of numbers, I don't know. It's really, it's hard to say because I think it it varies so much between genres, um, between what exactly are you trying to achieve with that? And what, what do you mean by breakout? Do you mm -hmm. mean that this is, you're going to be able to then use this to open for a bigger artist on tour? Or do you just mean that you're going to gain 10,000 more listeners or something like that? Um, and so it kind of is like a gauge with that. But I would say once you've released 
a full, a, a couple of full projects and singles, and you know, you have that experience. I think that that's when you can start putting out feelers for working with third parties, whether that be simply hiring an assistant to mm -hmm. help you make content or to help um, organize your calendar. So that way you're staying held accountable for things like that. I think a lot of people underestimate the power of being your own CEO of your music business company, because your music business entity should be an LLC. It should be a company. And so you should treat yourself as you are the boss of that company. So who are you going to bring in? And that doesn't even necessarily mean hiring a person or a company that can mean, am I going to spend this money this month on submit hub, or am I not going to make that decision or not? So, um, I think as far as PR, I am very, I have a very, um, special opinion about publicist music publicists and and I say that as somebody who still does PR for some of our clients but we don't necessarily do it in the same way that some other agencies do it um and I think that it's really easy to think well I have to pay this person like three thousand dollars a month or else I'm never gonna get any press for my stuff and this is my third album and I really want it to do well. So I just got to kind of shut up and handle it. If, if that amount of money won't realistically make sense for you. And I think it's important that artists are very, very, very serious with themselves about that because you can say, yes, I know I've thought about it and it is going to be a good investment. Sometimes it still isn't. And that's their ego because they, I think like, things like PR or getting playlist submissions. Um, a lot of the times those playlists don't have a lot of followers or a lot of the times those <laughs> blogs don't have a lot of readers. Um, but getting that article can feel so valuable to an artist, especially for a project that is so near and dear to their heart. Um, but you have to be realistic and realize how much of that is just fueling my ego mm -hmm. versus how much of that is actually making a long-term difference for my music business. Um, and so I think if you find a good PR agency or a play or, you know, whatever promotional company, I mean, all the things with that, you know, marketing, everything that you feel like there is a really strong connection with them. This is the time, you know, two to three albums in, this is the time to start putting those feelers out and see if that type of relationship will work for you. Um, don't make any big commitments. Do not try to hire a PR agency for a six month or 12 month contract because they will absolutely try to get you to do that because they're used to working with artists with big budgets who are gonna try to be super committed. And you just have to be serious with yourself and realize if that's not going to work. But if there's ever a time, I think that that would be the time to start putting those feelers out. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's so hard because artists, they're thinking in the back of their mind, well, you know, what is my return on investment on this? And a lot of times it's completely intangible. Yes, it you know? really <laughs> is. It, and I think that there is a good amount of value in that because it builds your SEO. It can help with credibility. You can use those press links for booking pitches or whatever else you want to do in the future. Um, but to, to what extent, you know, and you need to realize when do I need to pull back from that? I know a lot of um, small, small, small artists in town here who are working like two or three serving jobs in order to pay their publicity team when they're releasing three singles a year and they're mm. trying to pay a PR agency every single month because they feel like they have to because their colleagues are expecting that of them because that's mm. the industry standard when if that's not going to work for you that's not going to work for you and those decisions are what's going to make or break you to get to that Ariana Grande level yeah yeah that's true because you do you have to have the money to like continuously feed it a bit to be able to make momentum, right? Yes. But if feeding it is three thousand a month versus one thousand a month, you know it's a lot more doable at one thousand a month. Consistency, in my opinion, is more important than anything. If you yep. can maintain 
you know, a medium amount on the financial side or whatever that looks like. Um, that's so much more important than just like these three months, I'm going to go crazy. And then I'm not going to be able to do anything for the rest of the year. Oh, that's a, that's a really good point for sure. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so what about, what about investment? A lot of artists ask me, like, I'm just looking for an investor. Like how realistic <laughs> is that? Are there people that invest in artists? I think a lot of artists see that because I, I've even heard just today, I heard about a few artists in town who are getting really great investment deals, but it, it almost always is too good to be true. Um, especially if it's a person that you don't already have an existing relationship with. Um, I just recently heard about somebody who he was playing a show and this random person in a state that he doesn't even live in is a big fan and they just want to invest Yes, having that money could be could make a really big difference in your career, but at what cost? Um, you know, there's all these technicalities. Just because you have an investor doesn't just mean that you're going to get $5,000 and then or $5,000 a month or whatever, and you're free of that and you can just spend it however you please. Maybe that person's going to want to have a say in your career. Maybe they're going to want to see, like, listen to your songs before you release it to give you the green light. In a sense, the the control that labels have over artists can be somewhat similar to the control that investors can have mm -hmm. over artists. And if anything, it can have more of a toll on artists because it's more of an individual one-on-one -on -one relationship and so you can feel more indebted to that person and so I think you just need to enter those situations very carefully with a very good head on your shoulder um, I don't think that it's as common or as easy to find an investor as some artists who don't have the experience might think um, and I think because of that, they can be really quick to jump at any little investment opportunity that comes their way. So be very, very, very careful. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing, whether it's a label or an individual is you do not want to give up your creative control. Yes. It's, it's invaluable. It's priceless. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, oh my goodness. It's just, I could talk about that all day long because I think Having that self-confidence and the self-reliance as an artist is the most important thing you can do, no matter what your long-term goals are. Mm, yes. So let me ask you about what you guys do. I mean, I, I believe you called yourself a manager. It, how is that different from, say, an indie label? So we actually, so we're kind of half and half. So we... Okay have a few management clients where it's more of like your traditional management um, contract where we really help them navigate and we pitch them for opportunities and just try to help them grow their overall artist career. And then we have some clients who are more on a service basis. So they might hire us for to help them with the marketing side of their upcoming EP release or something like that. And we've really built the company to be able to be flexible for independent artists. So some artists, we have amazing long-term relationships relationships with them and they trust us we trust that trust them but that doesn't mean that they're working with us every single month maybe they come to us three times a year but then every time we pick up we pick up just where we left and you know there's no kind of like oh well you haven't been with us so we're gonna put you on hold and then we're gonna spend a month kind of lollygagging to say that we're prepping for you, but then you're still going to have to pay us and things like that. I, I have definitely experienced all of those things. So I've tried to really structure the business against all of those things. So that way, every single time an artist works with us, they get this wave of just relief of finally, like I have somebody who I can trust, who isn't going to be super expensive, but I know I'm always going to get a return on investment. And that's what's most important to me is that the money that these artists are paying us, we are spending that time. We are going above and beyond. And if we don't get the results that we were hoping for, because we also always make sure that we are genuine fans of our artists. And so we want good results for them. Maybe that means working a month overtime for free for them in order to meet our standards. And I think that that's starting to really set a precedent within my network and our company's network of people kind of realizing, oh, wait, like I can get that really awesome label support that I've always dreamed of without having to get into that gross contract. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big one for sure. (laughs) So what is the gamut of your guys' services that you offer? So half of our company, aside from the more management type of clients, half of our company is digital marketing. So social media, helping them with fan engagement, um, coming up with really creative marketing and branding plans behind songs, helping artists kind of realize what's the era of this single going to be? And how's that going to reflect on my social media? Or how's that going to reflect in my storytelling through interviews and things like that? But then how can we make sure that those those marketing plans are still tying back to the artist on a long-term basis in their general artist brand. Um, And then the other side of the company is more artist development, but not necessarily in the way that the industry has known it for all this time. So we're not doing so much like um, instrument lessons or interview training or things like that. We're actually starting to lay the basis in terms of PR. And going back to what I was saying about PR is not always valuable and it doesn't always make sense for every single release for an artist so real understanding when do we implement a PR campaign versus when do we maybe look at partnering you with an awesome nonprofit that somehow connects back to your music and how can we make it clear to the world whenever they google you that you are not just another artist making great music mm-hmm. give we need to give the world something to really latch on to. And so that's kind of like the two different halves of what we do, but obviously our day-to-day is crazy all over the place. I think every single day is very different for me. Sometimes that's very anxiety inducing. (laughs) And then sometimes it's really awesome. And I have those moments where I'm like, wow, this is this is why I do this. This is really amazing. And those kind of like magical little moments, but Yeah, so far it's been, it's been really awesome. We've got to work with a lot of really great artists. And I think that by being so loud about our beliefs in the industry, we've started to attract like-minded artists. And so working with them is just like a dream come true all the time. Mm, I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Like really leading with your values. Um, So I got to ask this one. What is your opinion about trying to get on playlists? Is it (laughs) worth it anymore? Ooh, because I'm I'm guessing most artists come to you, and that's one of the things they ask about. It is. It definitely is, and you know that there is the precedent that you need to be on all these playlists in order to get the streams and things like that. But the playlisting world is so muddy these days, and I think it's only going to continue to get muddy. Just as with the digital age growing and evolving, more and more scammers or more and more people who are just trying to make a quick butt buck with um, not maybe the best results in mind. Um, I know just things like playlists on Submit Hub, you can go on there and you might have to pay a dollar or whatever it is to submit, but then you look and they only have like maybe five listeners on the playlist. And that's where the thing about, is this an ego thing or is this a good business move thing? Um, And most of the time getting on playlists, it's just an ego thing. And you can, you know, algorithmically that might actually help you because on release day for your song to get added to 10 playlists will help Spotify know that people are loving it and things like that. But if those playlists are just bots, you know, that can actually hurt you times a million times whatever you invested in that oh my goodness I've had so many artists who have had to delete singles off of Spotify or had to start their Spotify page from scratch and it's just it's just honestly it's so disgusting that there are so many people out there who are so ready and happy and excited to take advantage of independent artists you know out of everybody in the world independent artists are the ones who have the least money you know Mm -hmm. and they're certainly not the ones to be taking advantage of but I think it's because they are excited about their song and they believe that it deserves to get a lot of attention and be on a lot of playlists so they're really quick and happy to say yes to any placements um but yeah I I think we approach playlisting from an organic perspective. So if we're pitching really awesome independent blog that has a a really authentic community of people who trust their recommendations, and then they have a playlist that therefore the song gets added to organically, that is amazing. But we're not going to enter into a campaign with playlists as our number one goal, because if we do, we're going to inevitably have to kind of bend and and say yes to opportunities that might 
not necessarily be the best long term. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And you can, I mean, there are definitely legitimate people on Submit Hub and you can research them. Definitely. But, you know, I mean, my, our podcast, Women of Substance, we take some placements from there every once in a while when we run out, but we usually don't run out anymore because we have a big following. You know what I mean? So yeah. people come straight to us. So, you know, that's one thing to consider. It's like the people are on there because they don't have a big enough following to be getting direct submissions anyway. That's important that's because they're that's a very just good point. wanting to make money off of it. You know, not that you make that much. I mean, it's I know. Like 50 cents a, a song or whatever, you know, it gets old really fast to listen to songs in order to make 50 cents per song. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that energy or the in monetary investment would maybe be better spent um, looking to connect with maybe an actual playlist curator who is mm -hmm. independent, who is really passionate. Maybe they don't have a lot of followers, but they're really stoked about your music and you can create a really good initial relationship with them that as they grow and as you grow, you guys can kind of grow together. I think having a network of people like that, even on like the video side or production, songwriting, whatever it may be, having a network of people who you can grow along with and not feel like, oh, well, I'm going to gatekeep this information for myself is what's going to benefit you, not just on the creative side, but also financially as well. Yeah, I agree with that. There, there are so many talented people out there that are up and coming. And, you know, if you guys can work together to push each other forward, you know, all boats rise with the tide. I always say that. Yeah, it's, it is, it's really hard. I think a lot of people feel like the industry has to be so competitive because that's what it's been seen as pretty much since its inception. But um, yeah, I think laying the groundwork uh, that kind of goes along with what we were saying about having that self-reliance and, and maybe having your own personal emergency fund along with all those things, taking the time in those early days to find the people who you can genuinely trust long term and that way whenever you get yourself into a pickle you have people to ask questions or advice from or lean on for even you know going back to the crowdfunding thing maybe those are the people who are going to help you crowdfund yep yeah. yep absolutely well this has been really really helpful we've talked about mm -hmm. so many really great subjects and things that are near and dear to my heart and you know for sure, drilling into the finance side is, I just think, so important. That's obviously why we've got the profitable musician, yeah. and the entrepreneur <laughs> musician. And, you know, that's those things are very important to me. And I have a finance background. So I'm glad we talked about those. Um, if people want to connect with you further, what is the best way for them to do that? Website, social media, all the things. Yeah. So our website is evergreenent.com. So Evergreen Entertainment, but entertainment is short. And then um, our, user, our username on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all the things is at E-V-G-N-E-N-T. So it's Evergreen Entertainment, but shortened All for short. usernames. <laughs> but at yeah. least you got the same one everywhere. That's helpful. Yeah. And we try to post um, a lot of, we actually have a blog that we just started on our website that I'm hoping to be able to post more things on about the business side of being an independent artist. And so maybe people can check that out. And then we also try to do Instagram posts that educate artists as well. We try to give back to the community as much as possible. Cool. That's exactly what we do. So I'll definitely <laughs> yep. connect with you on all the social medias. Thank Yay. you so much for you. sharing everything awesome. with us and just really, you know, offering your, your, your opinions, informed opinions of being in the industry for as long as you have, I think is really valuable. Oh, thank you for having me. I think it's so important to share this information any chance we get so we can all grow together. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. 
And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 